Good evening, tribute. Tales of the Hunger Games continue. Literary gore and spoilers will follow. The 64th Games. This year's games feature the highest number of suicides in the history of the Hunger Games, with a total of five tributes choosing to end their lives on their own terms, instead of being murdered by the other tributes or succumbing to the deadly conditions of the arena. This year's victor was Kashmir Richlund, aged 17, from District 1. Kashmir's older brother, Gloss, had won the previous year's games and brought pride and joy to his family and district. He had moved to the capital before this year's games reaping occurred, and even though Kashmir was not allowed to visit him, the siblings remained close by exchanging letters with each other, in which Kashmir was often in awe at all the parties, festivals and friendships that her brother had experienced since moving to the capital. Kashmir realised that her chances of being voted as District 1's tribute would be stronger if she emphasised that her brother had just won before, and that they were of similar breeding and background. Furthermore, it was realised by many in District 1 that Gloss's capital supporters would likely support Kashmir with sponsor gifts, which would definitely play in her favour, and hence make it much more likely that their district could create victors in two adjacent games. Therefore, along with 11 other young ladies, Kashmir volunteered for the role of female tribute. When it was time for her to show her talents, she threw knives at a target before ripping off a cloak to reveal a ruby dress, then took it in turns to use a weapon whilst removing more and more clothing, ultimately ending the number in a bejeweled corset, whilst performing an acrobatic routine. Upon finishing this routine, Kashmir was given a standing ovation by the audience of District 1, and this easily saw her through to the second round. Shortly before the debates with the other four tributes, one of Kashmir's strongest competitors, Glicena, came down with a crippling illness, which almost killed her and stopped her competing in this year's games. Another strong competitor, Ferra, competed in the debates alongside Kashmir and their two opponents. However, the audience noticed that although Ferra started strongly, her speech began to slur, and she soon became rather loud and acted foolishly. When she ran off the stage to vomit halfway through the debates, her goblet was checked, and instead of it containing water like the rest of the participants, it contained a clear liquid that was later identified as a tasteless liquor. Although she insisted that she had no knowledge of this liquid being there, she was not believed, and was ultimately struck off from volunteering in future games. This ultimately saw Kashmir awarded with the role of female tribute for this year's games. The male tribute this year was Maverick Johansson, a quiet yet wise young man, with good looks, rippling muscles and a strong talent for spears, especially in close proximity to other tributes. During the parade, Kashmir and Maverick wore ruby-studded garments, and whilst the chariot was halfway through the parade, they simultaneously ripped off their outer garments, which showed Maverick's bulging muscles and almost all of Kashmir's toned body, and caused a raucous cheer from the crowd, and instantly made the pair favourites in the eyes of the capital. At the start of the next week, Kashmir and Maverick met Barnabas and Diana, both from two, the latter of whom instantly made an impression on them. Diana spent most of her time trying to correct Barnabas's use of a variety of weapons, and was allegedly restrained in her apartment for a full day after attacking an Avox for putting too much salt on her meat one night at dinner. Kashmir and Maverick's mentors, Emerald and Flash, warned the pair that they would need to keep an eye on Diana, and potentially kill her early on, as she seemed extremely unstable and willing to kill anyone who got in her way. Kashmir used throwing knives during her demonstration, which gave her a training score of 9, just like her fellow careers except for Diana, who received a score of 10. It is kept strictly confidential as to what tributes do to earn their training scores, but one of the assessors allegedly left the training centre in tears after Diana's demonstration, whilst another took compassionate leave for the rest of the week. Few other tributes managed to receive scores above 6, and those who did were mainly from District 7 and 8, whilst the rest of the scores were not even worth mentioning. Kashmir's odds were also a respectable 7 to 1, which indicated that she was a strong contender to be victor. The next day, Kashmir was the first to be interviewed by Caesar Flickerman, and she made a very positive impression with the audience. Although she made some references to her brother having one, she spoke a lot about her own ambition and skills with knives. Caesar appeared smitten with her, and commented on how fabulous he had found her and Maverick's parade outfits to be. He even asked for her talent demonstration from District 1's voting process to be shown, which triggered rapturous applause from the audience when her final reveal was once again shown. This year's games took place in volcanic valleys. They featured vengeful bears, volcanic eruptions, and lasted for 13 days. As the platforms raised, the first thing that Kashmir and many other tributes noticed was the sweltering heat. 
Robin from 10, on the podium next to Kashmir, took off his jacket and he was about to throw it off, but then appeared to realise that this might trigger the mine surrounding his podium. As Kashmir looked around, she saw hills of dark volcanic dust rising away from the cornucopia and leading up to eight volcanoes, which were spaced out evenly at the edge of these hills and were quietly bubbling away. There were even rivers of lava gently flowing down the hills from these volcanoes, with some even reaching the cornucopia. Kashmir looked to the other side of the cornucopia and noticed that there was even a small river of lava flowing between Timbo from Seven and Maverick's podiums. However, there were plenty of supplies in the cornucopia, but especially lots of water this year. Kashmir was also pleased to see a set of throwing knives not too far from her podium, and so she set her sights on these as the countdown followed. When the gong sounded, Kashmir immediately ran forward and sprinted to the throwing knives. After grabbing them, she threw several of them at Robin and Jeannie from Six, sending them to the floor amidst the violent carnage. After noticing that some tributes were running away from the bottles of water that were placed in front of the weapons, Kashmir immediately ran to guard them and stopped any more tributes from trying to access one of these bottles. After defending these bottles for a bit longer, Kashmir found herself watching Diana, who was grinning as she pushed the head of Demel from Ten down into a puddle of lava, which was burning Demel's scalp and making her scream out in pain. Kashmir later stated that she wished she had thrown a knife at Diana there and then. After a few minutes, the initial bloodbath had ended, and Kashmir and her fellow careers inspected the cornucopia. They quickly removed their jackets, and although Barnabas was about to throw his away, Maverick pointed out that they should keep them as they might be useful. After taking the remaining supplies and weapons, along with those of the seven tributes that had already been killed, the careers moved outwards from the cornucopia. They tried to look for tributes who were fleeing into the distance, but the heat surrounding the cornucopia made it rather difficult to see clearly, along with the fact that they soon realised that there were many small hills before the eight volcanoes, which were useful for hiding behind. Over the first few hours, the career pack made their way up a hill towards one of the volcanoes. As they approached closer, they had to walk slower and slower in order to avoid the lava flows, which were now flowing thicker and faster. However, after changing paths several times, they managed to walk past this volcano. As they walked past and saw the lava was bubbling away, Diana concluded that it did not seem likely to erupt any time soon. They continued walking past this volcano and into the upper hills of the arena. Although there were no more lava trails in these upper hills, the air was still thick with smoke and made them cough rather intensely. Amidst a coughing fit, Diana announced that the group would be returning to the inner hills beneath the volcanoes, but Kashmir and Barnabas immediately disagreed and said that the other tributes were more likely to be in these upper hills. Diana said that there was no way to breathe, but then without speaking, Maverick took off his jacket and drenched it in the water from one of the bottles. He then held it over his mouth and breathed relatively easily before winking at Diana and continuing up the hills before she started coughing all over again. Kashmir and Barnabas followed suit quickly afterwards and walked after Maverick. Although Diana was clearly annoyed at her self-imposed authority being mocked, she carried on up the hill after the others. As the group continued to the perimeter, they noticed that the air was becoming clearer and it was easier to breathe. Early in the evening, the sun started to set, and so they rested by the perimeter whilst trying to look out for other tributes. That evening, there was only one instance where Barnabas thought he saw another tribute on the opposite side of the arena, but he was not even completely sure and so the group went to sleep and took turns to keep guard over their camp. Over the second day, the group roamed around the edge of the arena. It took them a long time to walk across these hills, and there were several occasions when the ground gave way beneath their feet, which caused them to slip down the hill. All four of them were starting to get annoyed by the afternoon, as they had so far failed to find any of the remaining tributes. However, shortly before the sun started setting and they were resting, Diana spotted Ellen from Five, walking slightly to their left and closer to the volcanoes. Without even telling the rest of the group what she had just seen, she ran down the hill towards Ellen, who through the thick smoke of the nearby volcano was unable to see who was coming towards her. As Ellen appeared more clearly through the smoke, Kashmir, Maverick and Barnabas realised why Diana had run down the hill. They spotted Ellen rubbing her eyes and making her way through the fog, then opened her eyes widely in terror as Diana approached. However, instead of killing Ellen instantly with the sword that she had in her hand, Diana grabbed Ellen and stabbed her in the back, which sent her to her knees. As Ellen screamed out for mercy, Diana menacingly circled her and stabbed her lightly in various parts of her body. Ellen continued to cry out in pain, but as Diana continued circling her, she stabbed her deeper and deeper, while smirking as the life left Ellen's body. 
After Ellen's cannon sounded and Diana started to make her way back up the hill, Maverick asked Barnabas if Diana was like this in District 2. Barnabas then looked back at Maverick in a rather dazed manner and said, The messed up thing is that she's actually really nice back home. That night, Diana was gifted with an extremely sharp knife, which Kashmir later stated she guessed was a reward for putting on a show. As the sun rose on the third day, Kashmir was on guard whilst the others slept. She started hearing screams coming from the inner hills, although she only heard one cannon, and the screams continue afterwards. Just as she was about to wake the other careers, she saw tributes running uphill between some of the other volcanoes. At this point, she immediately woke the others and told them what she was seeing. Within a minute, all four of them were charging down the hill to Fletch and Lisette, both from 12, who were now turning to flee back in the opposite direction between the volcanoes. As the careers approached even closer, they saw Lisette accidentally step into a small lava stream and then howl in pain, as Fletch tried to find his bottle of water to pour on her foot. As he was pouring water on Lisette's foot, the careers surrounded the pair, who looked at each other solemnly. Fletch looked down the hill at the lava and bellowing clouds of smoke, then up the hill towards the careers and with a resigned smile, Lisette stabbed herself in the neck, which immediately sounded her cannon. As the careers looked at each other in surprise, Fletch kissed his three middle fingers, raised them to the sky, and then slit his own throat. Kashmir tried to process what had just happened, but just at that moment she heard an almighty roar from within the smoke. As the hovercraft then entered in order to carry away Fletch and Lisette's bodies, Twitch from three ran screaming through the smoke from the direction where the roar had occurred. Her face when she then spotted the bodies, the hovercraft and the four confused careers was something that cannot be described with words, but Kashmir very quickly threw a knife at Twitch's head, which killed her on the spot. Just at that moment, a bear came clambering through the smoke and roared again once it saw the careers. They all instinctively turned to run, but it still became quite difficult to travel quickly uphill, especially with the ground slipping away beneath them and a wind causing the smoke from the volcanoes to flow towards them. Barnabas and Kashmir both threw knives at the bear, which did not kill it but managed to slow it down. The group continued climbing slowly up the hill as more bears came through the smoke and made their way towards them. Maverick used his spear to grip into the volcanic dust and this significantly helped him to travel uphill. The group spotted him doing this and used their weapons as well to grip into the hills and climb them. One of the bears got very close to Maverick and Kashmir, but Maverick used his spear to stab the bear through the heart, which killed it. Eventually, the group made it to more level ground and survived the armada of bears, but almost all of their arrows and knives had been used. With 11 tributes remaining at the start of the fourth day, the careers woke up to find that they had practically run out of food. They argued for a while about what to do, and even when they shouted out for sponsors to send them food, nothing arrived. Unbeknownst to them, head game maker Harley Breen had placed a temporary ban on food being sent into the arena. Just as the group argued about where they could get food from, Kashmir asked if they could eat meat from the bears. Within minutes, Kashmir, Maverick and Barnabas were back down by the volcanoes and shooting their weapons at a bear, until it eventually collapsed and died. Meanwhile, Diana was building a makeshift skewer over a shallow puddle of burning lava and she was being very careful not to fall in. They then ripped off the bear's fur and cooked one of its legs on the skewer, desperately hoping that the meat would be edible. Diana said that as she had made the skewer, she would have the first piece. The others exchanged exasperated looks but didn't bother to argue. However, as Diana tried to take a piece of meat, she accidentally touched the burning skewer with her little finger and yelped out in pain. Just as Diana made this unusual shriek, Barnabas, who was standing next to her, laughed out loud at the sound she had just made. Diana was so annoyed that she grabbed him by the arm and pushed him straight into the lava puddle. Kashmir stood still in shock whilst watching what had just happened, until Barnabas managed to stumble up and turn around. It appeared that he was meaning to scream, but his eyes, nose, mouth and vocal cords were corroding away as he stumbled forwards. Kashmir screamed in horror and Maverick vomited in disgust, before Diana kicked him in the chest, which made him fall back into the puddle of lava. His body shook slightly as it continued corroding. This time, Diana wrapped her jacket around her hand before grabbing the skewer. Once she had taken off the meat, Barnabas's cannon sounded. After taking a few bites, Diana looked at Kashmir and casually remarked, this could do with some salt. Kashmir later admitted that during this time she was completely unsure as to whether or not Diana was actually insane or just playing mind games with them. As Kashmir, Maverick and Diana awoke by the perimeter the next morning, they heard one of the volcanoes that was further away from them erupting. A scream was heard shortly followed by a cannon and they could see that lava had not just spewed down the hill 
but had also projected up the hill, almost to the perimeter. Shortly afterwards, they saw another one of the volcanoes erupting. This time, there was no cannon, but they could see at least two tributes running away from the spewing lava. At this point, Maverick pointed out that as long as they stuck to the perimeter, they could work together to kill the tributes who fled from the eruptions. The trio then skirted the perimeter for the next two days, as the volcanoes continued erupting. There did not appear to be any pattern to how they were erupting, but this inconsistency helped them find Proper Loro from 5 and later Lake from 4. As both of these tributes fled to safety from the molten lava flows and straight towards Maverick, Kashmir and Diana appeared from behind neighbouring hills and stopped them from escaping. Meanwhile, the tributes from District 7 and 8 had run out of water, and although they were sent some by sponsors, it was not enough to keep them all adequately hydrated, which along with the intense heat, led to this group becoming weak and irritable. As the sun set on this sixth day, the volcano stopped erupting, and the amount of lava they were emitting significantly reduced, which in turn made the inner hills more hospitable. As Diana was sleeping, Kashmir reminded Maverick of what Flash and Emerald had told them about her, and that perhaps they should abandon her. Maverick considered it and suggested that they kill her the next evening, when there were less tributes left. However, when the tributes awoke the next day, the game makers announced that a feast would shortly occur and that they planned to be generous with the tributes. The career pack had since been gifted with some food and water, so they were hoping for weapons as they made their way down to the inner hills. They were pleased to notice that the volcanoes were emitting a lot less lava, but unlike previous arenas, there was not a forest surrounding the cornucopia, which had allowed previous tributes to hide as they waited for the feast bags to arrive. They therefore waited next to one of the volcanoes and tried to look around for other tributes who were doing the same, but to no avail. Eventually, the sponsor bags appeared from the cornucopia platform. As the careers ran down the hill towards the cornucopia, they spotted other tributes also running inwards. However, as they got closer, Kashmir realised that each of the bags only contained a water bottle, and she was unsure if these were worth taking. She quickly mentioned this to the others as they ran inwards, and Maverick agreed, but Diana stated that they could kill the others when they arrived in the cornucopia. Kashmir told Diana that she disagreed, but when Diana then threatened Kashmir with a knife, Maverick hit Diana on the head with the side of his spear, which knocked her to the ground. Kashmir and Maverick then ran back up the hill and in between the volcanoes, whilst Diana regained consciousness and angrily got to her feet, before she watched the remaining tributes fight over the water bottles. Although she looked around for Kashmir and Maverick, they had run away by this point. Amazingly, only Lilith from 8 died during this feast. For the next two days, Kashmir and Maverick rested at the edge of the cornucopia and survived by rationing their remaining food and water. They stayed alert for other tributes who might be approaching, especially Diana. Another cannon boomed out on the ninth day, and the pair hoped that it was Diana, but it was later revealed to be Tallahassee, from six. On the eleventh day, Kashmir and Maverick decided to roam around the arena near to the volcanoes in an effort to find the remaining tributes. However, just as they were both climbing over one of the steeper hills, a hand suddenly appeared over the top of this hill and stabbed Maverick in the eye. He yelled out in pain, and Kashmir got several throwing knives ready as they slid back down the hill. Just then, Timbo appeared over the top of the hill and pounced towards Maverick. However, as he was jumping through the air, Kashmir threw a knife straight at his heart, which killed him instantly and sounded his cannon as he hit the ground. Just as she then grabbed Maverick, who was now heavily wounded, the pair were tackled to the ground and collapsed in a cloud of volcanic dust. Kashmir spluttered and winced as she tried to look through the cloud of dust for whoever had just tackled her and Maverick. Just then, Gors from 8 suddenly rose up through the dust cloud with a knife in his hand. He stabbed Kashmir in the leg and she screamed out in pain. He also appeared to be struggling from the effects of the dust and blindly stabbed around for Kashmir, who was desperately trying to edge backwards. However, just at that moment that Kashmir was shuffling back on her hands and feet, she heard a cannon sound. As the cloud then lifted, she saw a silhouette through the cloud of gauze with a spear through his head. She then realised that despite having lost a large amount of blood and almost his consciousness as well, Maverick had managed to grab his spear and thrust it through Gauze's head, which killed him whilst he was trying to attack Kashmir. She went over to try and help Gauze, but just as she pulled him backwards from the lingering dust cloud, his cannon rang out and shortly afterwards the hovercraft arrived and took the three bodies. Although Kashmir was pleased to still be alive, she was dreading the inevitable fight that would occur with Diana. She spent the next day wandering upwards and to the perimeter, in order to have a better view of the rest of the arena which she hoped would allow her to see Diana approaching. Unbeknownst to Kashmir, Diana had the same idea, but she circled the perimeter that night when it was dark. Amazingly, she walked just metres from Kashmir, without either of the pair noticing. 
However, the next day, as the girls awoke, the klaxon sounded, and they both knew that this meant they needed to instantly return to the cornucopia. They were both correct, and just as they were making their way down the opposite sides of the upper hills, volcanic lava started pouring from all around the perimeter. They continued running faster and faster, past the volcanoes and down the inner hills, but when Kashmir was within the cornucopia clearing, she tripped and stumbled down against one of the podiums. Diana then ran towards Kashmir, but the pair noticed that the lava was quickly flowing towards them, and they both ran towards the cornucopia in order to climb to safety. Kashmir later stated that she wished she had thrown a knife at Diana whilst they were running, but they were both indeed too scared by the approaching lava. When both girls reached the roof of the cornucopia, their fight resumed. Diana fired several arrows at Kashmir, who threw several knives back at Diana. They were both quick to dodge each other's attacks, and remarkably failed to injure each other. However, shortly after dodging one of Kashmir's knives, Diana failed to realise that she was extremely close to the edge of the cornucopia's structure. But Kashmir did realise, and then lunged towards Diana, who instinctively jumped back. As Diana started to lose her balance by the edge, her eyes widened in terror, and she let out a scream as she fell backwards into the lava. Kashmir decided to not look over the edge as she heard Diana's spine-tingling cries of pain, whilst her body was burned away by the lava. Kashmir sat down on top of the cornucopia, and much to the capital's surprise, she burst into tears. She later stated that it was a mix of relief of surviving and happiness at having won this year. She was then airlifted to safety and requested to spend the next few days before the victor's interview in a specially made frozen room. Kashmir went on to move to the capital in order to be with her brother, and the pair continued to have many suitors and enjoy a plethora of relationships. However, they both went on to die in the 75th Hunger Games. Please excuse my spelling of the word short. The 65th Games. Although there were other victors who were 14 years old when they won their games, this year's victor was reaped on his 14th birthday, which made him the youngest victor in the history of the Hunger Games. This year's victor was Finnick O'Dare, age 14, from District 4. When Finnick's name was called at the reaping, he immediately switched from happiness regarding his birthday celebrations, which were supposed to happen that evening, to misery that this birthday would probably be his last. As Finnick made his way to the platform, a recent ex-girlfriend, Piker, started whistling happy birthday in order to mock him. This generated some laughter within the female section of the reaping square until a nearby peacekeeper slapped Piker around the face and she was quickly silent again. When Finnick was on the platform, he shook hands with his district partner, Tina, who was a rather pretty 16-year-old, but one that was also very dull and now apparently miserable at the imminent games. The next evening, once Finnick and Tina were in the capital, the tribute parade took place. Being from District 4, they wore deconstructed outfits made from fishing nets, which Fennec's mentor, Farrell McCain, and their stylist, Genesis Ring, decided would be best for the pair to wear. This was in order to show off as much of their bodies as possible, after Genesis had heard many of his colleagues admiring the pair, especially Finnick. During training that week, Finnick worked primarily with spears, but also improved his skills with knives. Unbeknownst to him at the time, he impressed the careers with his weaponry, and they briefly considered inducting him into their pack. Adela, from Six, also asked Finnick for help with using a spear, and in exchange for showing her how to use one to catch fish, she helped him create different colours for camouflage by using natural materials such as mud and sand. When Finnick's training score was assessed, he put on an impressive display with the knives and a spear, which gave him a very respectable score of 8 and led him to receive equally respectable odds of 10 to 1. The only tributes that scored higher than him were tributes from Districts 1 and 2, whilst Adela put on a meagre display with a knife and scored a 5, which was roughly the median of all this year's 24 training scores. When the interviews occurred, Finnick made a very good impression with the capital audience. He used his quick wit and charm, with Caesar Flickerman even joking about him seeming older than 14. As Finnick went into the games, many young ladies in and out of the capital were rather smitten with his boyish charm and hoped that he would do well in the games. This year's games took place on a forest island. They featured timid wolves, tracker detonations, and lasted for eight days. When Phoenix's platform raised into the cornucopia clearing, he later revealed that he was relieved to see a relatively normal-looking cornucopia and surrounding forest, especially after remembering the volcanic horror that had awaited tributes the year before. Furthermore, having grown up in a shack by the sea, Phoenix instantly recognised the smell of the sea and realised that it was most likely that they were all on an island. Therefore, he immediately planned to run to the perimeter once he had a weapon. 
When the gong sounded, Finnick sprinted forward to the knives and grabbed one, before instantly having to duck from a spear that was thrown by Glistena from one. He then grabbed a water bottle as he ran backwards and out of the cornucopia, whilst running past Tina, who was being stabbed continuously by Tiberius from two. He ran away as quickly as he could from the piercing screams that echoed out of the cornucopia. Once he had reached a comfortable distance within the forest, he slowed down but carried on jogging until he reached the rocky coastline a short while later. Finnick was surprised to see that the cornucopia was this close to the perimeter, but later in the games he learned that the cornucopia was in the far north area of this circular island, and the other areas of coastline were much further away from the cornucopia. He was already hungry after running so fast, and he therefore made a makeshift spear from a nearby tree, before using it to catch fish, which he ate as the sun set. That night he slept in a rocky alcove next to the beach, which he chose as it was likely to hide him from passing tributes, especially when it was dark. The next morning, Finnick travelled carefully through the arena. He sometimes noticed wolves appearing throughout the paths, but they appeared to be more scared of him than he was of them. However, as he walked past one of the larger clearings, he ducked down when he heard screaming. As Finnick crouched down behind a fallen tree trunk, he looked over it and saw Adela running through the clearing and straight towards him, whilst Raimundo from Ten was quickly pursuing her and had almost caught up with her. Finnick later revealed that he had to quickly weigh up his options, and he then decided that Adela would make a decent ally, not only because he had already built a rapport with her, but also because he would be more likely to beat her in a fight. When Raimundo finally caught up with Adela and tackled her to the ground, he raised his machete and was just about to stab her, but Finnick tackled him in the nick of time, which stopped him from stabbing Adela. Raimundo then attacked Finnick, and the pair engaged in a particularly violent fight, in which Finnick was stabbed in the arm, but he eventually got the upper hand and managed to stab Raimundo through the head. Many capital citizens noted how lucky Adela was to be saved by Finnick, and although he had been popular beforehand, this made him even more popular and his victory odds improved. Once Finnick had rested, he and Adela took Raimundo's food and machete, then Finnick led Adela back to the area where he had spent the previous night. As the next day went by, Finnick sharpened more sticks, and Adela kept a lookout. The pair got on well and had several interesting conversations about their respective districts. Finnick tried to flirt with Adela, but she quickly, yet comically, let him know that she was not interested. That afternoon, after joking that he had eaten enough fish for one lifetime, Finnick gathered some plants and berries from the nearby forest and shared them with Adela. However, when Finnick was about to eat some nightlock berries, Adela quickly grabbed his wrist and told him that they were poisonous. Finnick did not initially believe her, and joked that she only said this as she wanted them all for herself. Adela then told him to eat these berries if he wanted, and sat back with a comically smug grin. Finnick was tempted to eat them just to show that he was not scared, but after a few moments' delay, he ultimately decided not to, and Adela joked in a self-satisfied manner that he needed her just as much as she needed him. During the victor's interview, Finnick stated that there was a unique quality to Adela that was different to all the other girls he had liked. By the next day, there were still 13 tributes remaining, and as the pair woke up, Finnick was alarmed to hear what sounded like whistling swiftly moving towards their alcove. He and Adela held their weapons at the ready as they tentatively walked out and onto the rocks. However, they saw the parachute of a sponsor gift nestled within the surrounding rocks, and Finnick waited while Adela checked to see what this gift was. Finnick was about to return back into the alcove, but when Adela told him that it was a trident, he slowly turned around in confusion. Finnick checked the trident along with Adela, and the number four was branded on the handle, which indeed confirmed that it was a gift for him. He was somewhat surprised, but then grabbed it and walked back into the cave. As he walked back, Adela asked him why he did not say thank you to the sponsor who gifted it to him. This in turn raised her popularity among viewers, and saw her gifted with a pack of matches later in the day. The trident was the most expensive gift that had so far been gifted into any arena, and although game makers could not reveal who had sent each gift to tributes, many wealthy capital citizens, especially women, claimed that it was a gift from them, and that if Finnick won, they should be allowed to meet with him. This gift on its own also showed Finnick how desirable he had become in the eyes of the capital. He and Adela then set off into the forest in order to try and find some other tributes. Once they had made their way inland, they saw Lucelle from Three resting in a nearby clearing, trying to drink any water she could get out of her bottle. Adela was about to discuss attacking her, but when Finnick saw that she had some rope with her, he threw his trident straight through the clearing and it impaled her through the heart, which killed her within seconds. Finnick then formulated a plan with Adela to kill other tributes by converting the rope into a net and using this to trap any tributes that walked by. Being no stranger to fishing nets, 
Finnick cut and rearranged the rope until he had constructed an inescapable net. Adela then agreed to use herself as bait in order to entice these tributes to chase her. For the rest of that day, she waited in a nearby clearing, and whenever she ran from a tribute who spotted her, she carefully jumped over the spot where the net was triggered, but other tributes did not, and so whilst chasing Adela, they quickly found themselves pinned to the floor beneath the inescapable net trap that Finnick had created. That day, he and Adela used this strategy to trap and kill Fella from 9 in the late morning, Groucho from 12 in the mid-afternoon, and finally Dolora from 10 whilst the sun was setting. Although the three of them, especially Dolora, called out for mercy, Finnick and Adela ignored their pleas and killed them without hesitation. The next day, Finnick and Adela awoke near the cornucopia and travelled south to the other end of the island. However, shortly after taking a rest in the forest, they heard a cannon, followed by shouting coming from nearby. They quickly ran to where the shouting was coming from and then hid behind a tree as they watched Glicena holding a knife to Tiberius's neck, whilst Elias from one tried to convince her not to kill him. They continued pleading, but Adela quietly whispered to Finnick that it would be good to have Elias and Tiberius on their side instead of being their targets. Therefore, whilst Elias was still trying to negotiate with Glistena, Finnick crept up behind her and rammed his trident through her head, which sounded her cannon before her body had even hit the floor. However, Finnick was surprised that instead of Elias and especially Tiberius being grateful to him, they immediately grabbed their weapons and faced off against Finnick. Elias and Tiberius both made several threats against Finnick, who looked ready to attack. But Adela got in the middle of the opposing sides and calmly stated that they were more likely to survive against the four remaining tributes if they all worked together. After a few tense moments, all three boys lowered their weapons and agreed. Finnick revealed later that at this moment in particular, he was surprised and impressed by Adela's bravery and diplomacy. The group made their way back to the cornucopia and spent the night there. However, as they awoke the next morning, a feast was announced. The group waited just outside the cornucopia for their feast bags to appear. When they did appear, they each grabbed their bags very quickly and then returned to where they had just waited, whilst Tiberius readied his bow and arrow, and Elias prepared his spear. When Boost from 5 and Charg from 3 entered the cornucopia just seconds later, Tiberius quickly shot Boost, and Elias threw his spear at Charg, which killed the pair almost simultaneously. However, during this fight, Nitta from 8 ran through the clearing and carefully avoided the career's spears and arrows. She even managed to grab her feast bag and then ran away from the clearing without being hit. Elias, Tiberius, Finnick and Adela then ran through the clearing after her, and continued chasing her until she tripped not too far away from the cornucopia. Eventually they caught up with her, and Tiberius tackled her to the ground, before stabbing her through the head with his spear, which killed her within a few seconds. That night, the group rested on a nearby beach and discussed their tactics for the next day. They knew that Jordan, from 8, was the only living tribute not in their group, but Tiberius and Finnick had different ideas on how they could find him. However, that night as they rested, Finnick tried to persuade Adela to run away with him, as Tiberius and Elias would likely turn on them soon, possibly even before they had killed Jordan. She eventually agreed that they should do so in the morning, but before they had the chance to run away that next morning, Tiberius and Elias had woken up, and so it was practically impossible for Finnick and Adela to break from their group. The four of them continued through the forest until the early afternoon, when rain started falling. However, they very quickly realised that it was in fact acid rain that was falling, and they scattered in different directions, with Tiberius running up the hill through the forest and taking cover in a nearby lake, whilst Adela and Finnick continued through the forest in front of them. However, Elias fell over whilst he was running, which knocked him to the ground, and although he ultimately survived the storm, his skin was badly corroded by the acid rainfall. Once Finnick and Adela escaped to relative safety, and the acid rainfall stopped, they continued travelling away from Tiberius, and then rested that night in a rocky cliff face, as they took turns to keep watch and sleep. The next day, the pair continued to travel ahead until they reached the beach. They then travelled up the rocky beach until the early afternoon, when they almost collided with Elias, who had just been chased by the wolves, presumably after they smelt the blood from his wounds. Finnick hesitated to attack Elias, but when Elias threw a knife which narrowly avoided hitting Finnick and Adela, Finnick quickly stabbed Elias with his trident before he fell into the sea and his cannon sounded. Almost immediately after this, the game makers announced that the three remaining tributes had three minutes to return to the cornucopia and that if they were not there in time, their trackers would detonate. All three remaining tributes subsequently sprinted as quickly as they could back to the cornucopia clearing, and when the countdown ended, Tiberius appeared from the grass and sprinted to Finnick before they engaged in combat. Adela tried to attack Tiberius, but just as he was about to stab her, 
Finnick tackled him and they engaged in empty-handed combat until Finnick reacquired his trident and stabbed Tiberius through the stomach, which killed him very quickly after. Finnick then turned to face Adela, and they realised to their mutual dismay what would now happen. Adela apologised before the pair engaged in a very brief fight, which resulted in Finnick impaling Adela with his trident, before apologising to her as well. Just seconds later, Adela fell to the floor and died, which left Finnick as this year's victor. After winning, Finnick became a very popular victor in the capital, due to his record for being the youngest victor in the history of the games, along with his good looks and weaponry. As he grew older, he moved to the capital, where he allegedly had many different lovers, However, he still maintained a strong rapport with the other victors of his district, especially Tina's mentor, Mags. Finnick went on to marry his fellow victor, Annie Crester, but unfortunately he betrayed the capital during the rebellion of 76 and was killed whilst fleeing through the sewers from capital forces. After Finnick died, Annie gave birth to his son, who she named Finnick after his father. Finnick Jr. also went on to compete in the 80th Hunger Games in 92. The 66th Games. This year's victor was said to be made within this year's games and is still to this day referred to as the Spirit of Pan Am. This year's victor was Jackson Spidell, aged 18, from District 10. Jackson was thought by his peers to be a slightly unusual young man, but many who knew him better could tell that he had always possessed some extraordinary skills. During the reaping, he stood at the very back of the waiting area, seeing as he was one of the oldest and tallest young men but also so that he could have some space from the others, especially seeing as he disliked being touched by people he did not know. When his name was called and the district escort, Rosa Sickle, asked the crowd where Jackson was, sniggers were heard throughout the male tribute area. As he was escorted up to the platform, Jackson stopped on several occasions, before he was pushed onwards by the peacekeepers, much to the crowd's amusement. Jackson's district partner was Rio Chavez. She was a bit younger than Jackson and had a kind and pretty face. As Rosa introduced Jackson and Rio to the nearby cameras, she prompted them to shake hands with each other. They swiftly did so, and then just as Rosa was about to wish the crowd a happy Hunger Games, Jackson put out his left hand towards Rio. She seemed slightly confused, but then realised that Jackson wanted to shake this hand as well. Some of the crowd laughed, but Rio quickly offered her left hand and shook Jackson's hand again, whilst giving a sharp look to the crowd, which quickly silenced the remaining laughter. When Jackson and Rio arrived in the capital the following evening, Jackson later stated how overwhelmed he was by the colourful clothes and decorations, along with a huge amount of people that often seemed to be everywhere he went. For the parade the next day, Jackson's mentor, Alejandro, stated that he would also be Jackson's stylist. Each year during the game season, Alejandro allegedly spent most of his time on morphling and therefore proved to be very unhelpful as a mentor. However, he often became very excited for the parade and designed District 10's outfits himself. It is often rumoured that Jackson and Alejandro did not get on well and that Alejandro begged Michelle, Rio's mentor, to swap places with him, but she refused. Allegedly due to Alejandro's dislike of Jackson, he made him and Rio wear black and white spotted suits that were designed to resemble cows. Furthermore, Jackson had to wear horns upon his head and he appeared to be very uncomfortable whilst in this outfit. He even critiqued it during his victor's interview, stating that at the time he hated it mostly because the horns were slightly different lengths and that Alejandro hadn't even got this right, much to Alejandro's embarrassment. However, as the chariots made their way through the crowds, Rio waved to her side of the audience. She noticed Jackson not waving and said that he should wave. When he shook his head, she reminded him that he could do it with both hands if he wanted and subsequently he started waving to the audience on his side. During the training that occurred over the next week, Jackson appeared to be intimidated by all the loud noises and fighting that was going on, and so he spent most of his time sitting quietly in the survival area. This led to the career tributes mocking him, but he deliberately ignored their laughter. On the second day after Jackson had hardly done anything, Rio approached him and told him that he should try to practice something. Jackson asked why Rio was being so nice to him, and she responded that they each had a better chance of surviving the games if they helped each other. Seeing as Rio had indeed been very supportive so far, Jackson agreed to practice something. Rio quietly suggested that he attack the training dummy that was next to where the career pack was resting. He then proceeded to continuously punch it with his left hand and then his right hand, until a minute later when he punched it so violently with his left hand that it broke off its spring and hit the floor next to where the careers were sat. They looked quite surprised and were no longer laughing, so Jackson punched the broken dummy one more time with his right hand and then walked away. Rio nodded approvingly at Jackson as he walked back to the survival station. 
When it was time to assess the tribute's training scores, Jackson was particularly tough to judge, seeing as the assessors had noticed that he had shown moments of strength and talent, but that it was tough to bring Jackson to these moments, especially when he was on his own. After simply punching a dummy for a few minutes, he scored a 5, which put him on the lower end of the male tributes. He received odds of 20 to 1, which did not particularly highlight him as a potential winner, whilst Rio received the score of 6, and the career pack scored 9s and 10s. Furthermore, without Rio there to save him, Jackson's pre-game interview was a disaster. Even though Caesar Flickerman tried hard to have some banter or even a basic conversation with Jackson, the bright lights and large crowd made Jackson extremely nervous, and silence prevailed, with Caesar accepting Jackson's nods of the head for answers and filling the rest of the silence with awkward laughter. This year's games took place in bountiful wheat fields. They featured serene horses, a targeted tornado, and lasted for 12 days. When Jackson's podium raised into the cornucopia, he looked around to see a wheat field of waist-height wheat surrounding the cornucopia clearing. He looked further and saw that the arena was as flat as the eye could see. There were many supplies, but the only weapons he could see were some scythes, which were stacked up on the back wall of the cornucopia. Jackson looked over and saw Rio standing on the other side of the cornucopia. When she made eye contact with Jackson, she gave him a sympathetic nod, and he then focused on running away from all the carnage that was likely to ensue. However, with just 15 seconds left of the countdown, Jackson looked to his left and saw Tacoma from Seven, who was stood on the podium next to him. She was very tightly gripping a small wooden ball in her hand and breathing slowly, but just as the countdown hit 13 seconds, she gripped the ball so tightly that it squeezed out of her fingers and fell towards the ground. In the split second that followed, Jackson appeared to realise that there were mines in place to stop the tributes running before the gong, and as Tacoma's ball hit the ground, Jackson braced himself and screwed up his eyes. An almighty boom followed, and then a wave of earth and blood splattered him and several other nearby tributes. Jackson later stated that during the remaining countdown, he could only hear a high-pitched sound, and he was unaware that many of the other tributes were screaming, and Emma, from Nine, who was stood on the other side of Tacoma, shouted that this was not fair, while she frantically tried to pull one of Tacoma's fingers out of her hair. Even in Viewing Square, calls of unfairness and for starting over were clearly heard, but the countdown continued down to zero. Later, once all the tributes had moved from the cornucopia clearing, a temporary boundary was placed around this area, due to the hovercraft sending in several workers to scrape off the remains of Tacoma's body from her podium, which the game makers considered would not go down well with the capital's viewers if they continued to see this grim sight littered across the ground when other tributes returned to the cornucopia. The gong then sounded, and most tributes ran into the centre to grab some supplies, although most of those on the podiums near to Tacoma either ran or stayed still in the shock of what had just happened. In a daze, Jackson stepped off his podium and watched the bloodbath that was now occurring in front of him. Meanwhile, Rio had run forward and managed to grab a backpack. She then saw Jackson and ran straight towards him. As she approached, Jackson started to focus again. Then Rio grabbed him by the arm and led him away through the surrounding wheat field. As they ran away, Jackson glanced back and saw Bertram from Eleven, who had been stood on the podium to Jackson's other side. He was apparently collapsed on his own podium, and it was revealed to viewers that when Tacoma's podium had detonated, a jagged piece of metal from the podium had hit him in the eye, which ultimately led him to being blinded in this eye, and then dying in the bloodbath. After Rio and Jackson made it out of the central wheat field, Jackson's hearing started to return, and he heard Rio encouraging him to move forwards. He insisted that she take him by the other hand for the same amount of time, which she agreed to, and then when the same amount of time had passed, they continued jogging away from the cornucopia, and approximately an hour later, they decided to rest in a small grove of trees. Rio checked the backpack and found a water bottle and rope inside, but apparently no food. Jackson was still clearly alarmed at being covered in Tacoma's blood, and over the rest of the first day, Rio picked pieces of body parts out of Jackson's hair and clothing until they found a stream in between two fields which Jackson used to clean Tacoma's blood from his body. Once he was relatively clean again, he appeared to become more present within the moment. They drank some water and then agreed to alternate between sleeping and keeping watch. Over the second day, Jackson and Rio explored the surrounding fields, and after travelling for a while, they were surprised to see horses wandering through the fields. When two horses approached the pair, Rio, who had grown up on one of District 10's few horse farms, reminded Jackson that they should stay as still as possible in case the horses were aggressive, which Jackson very quickly agreed to, as he had always been rather scared of many animals. Jackson and Rio continued to roam through the fields of horses, 
and were pleased to discover that they were not aggressive, but in fact quite the opposite. Rio gave some of the horses names and made a point of stroking them, which made Jackson realise that they were indeed safe to touch. However, as they continued walking through this field, Jackson spotted the career pack in an adjacent field, and he immediately alerted Rio that they needed to hide within the wheat. As they looked over, they saw Bahia from one, keeping her distance from the horses, and they also heard her complaining about the gnats that surrounded them, which were buzzing around her hair. The rest of the careers teased her for this, and Rio and Jackson continued watching her for a bit longer. As the sun set, Jackson realised that they no longer had any food, water or weapons, but that night, as they watched and listened to the career pack, they heard Boris and Laverne, both from two, agree to travel towards the cornucopia in order to find and kill other remaining tributes, whilst Bahia and Platino, both from one, would stay and guard the camp. Jackson then told Rio of a plan he came up with to use one of the horses to scare off Bahia, which could maybe allow him and Rio to take some supplies from the Korea's camp. Once the night sky set in and Rio and Jackson saw that Boris and Laverne had left, they carefully crept through the wheat field, beneath the wheat surface, until they reached one of the horses, approximately 50 metres from the career camp. Rio very carefully tied the rope around the horse's leg whilst whispering to him to keep calm, then crawled along the ground towards the careers whilst gently pulling on the rope, which led the horse with her. Meanwhile, Jackson followed behind her until they were close enough to hear the careers' conversation. Just then, Baia screamed out as she saw the silhouette of the horse approaching through the darkness. Rio continued shuffling forwards through the wheat, which led the horse to run towards their camp, and Bayer then grabbed her sword and ran away whilst Platino tried to stand his ground, but as he did not have his weapon in his hand at the time, even he was concerned by the large horse that was galloping towards their camp, and he found himself edging backwards, before he fell backwards into the fire and badly burned his leg. Whilst Platino was screaming out in pain, Rio and Jackson seized their opportunity, with Rio grabbing some water bottles and Jackson kicking Platino back into the fire when he was trying to get up. He made sure he kicked Platino again with his other leg, whilst Baia ran away screaming and trying to shield her hair from the gnats, which were now busily buzzing around the fire. Although Platino did not die, his legs were badly burned, and Rio and Jackson ultimately escaped with a scythe, two water bottles and a loaf of bread. The pair continued to flee from the career camp until they reached the perimeter. They took turns sleeping and keeping watch for the rest of the night, and some of the next morning as well, whilst a herd of horses chose to rest near them as well, much to Rio's delight. However, later that day, they were surprised to see Emmer and Blade, both from Nine, approaching towards them in the distance. Jackson held the scythe in both hands as they approached, and from safe distance, they asked if they could join forces with Rio and Jackson in exchange for the food that they had on them. Rio and Jackson looked at each other rather sceptically, but Emmer pointed out that they would have a better chance of defeating the career pack if they worked together, which ultimately convinced Rio to accept this offer whilst Jackson was still unsure as they were strangers to him. The group stayed together by the perimeter until the next day, which made it easier for them to take turns relaxing and keeping watch. Jackson spent most of his time guarding their camp instead of talking to Emma and Blade, and although they were sharing food and helping Rio feed wheat to the horses, Jackson felt overwhelmed and wanted to be alone. The next day, with ten tributes left, the group decided to travel inwards to the cornucopia, as they guessed that the feast would soon occur and they wanted to be close enough to the cornucopia for when it happened. However, just as the four of them were walking through a field, Emma, who had been at the back of the group, suddenly screamed, and Jackson turned round to see that she had been stabbed through the neck by Nucleo from five. As Jackson was registering what was happening, Blade ran towards Nucleo, and they engaged in a violent scythe fight with each other. After a few swipes into the fight, Nucleo slashed Blade's shoulder, which sent blood straight onto Jackson's left arm. Blade fell to the ground and Nucleo fought Rio, who was the next nearest person to him. Although she was empty-handed, she managed to disarm Nucleo, and so he pushed her to the ground and started strangling her. As Jackson was watching Rio being strangled, he looked extremely disconcerted that he had blood on his left arm, but not his right arm. However, as he looked at Rio's panicked expression, he went against all his instincts and grabbed Blade's scythe, then ran towards Nucleo and stabbed him through the back of the head. As Rio and Blade got back up, Jackson appeared to be dazed, and later stated that he was in shock that he had almost let his district partner and friend die in order to satisfy his compulsions. When the trio awoke the next day, they could see a large tornado moving around the opposite side of the arena, and occasionally cannons could be heard as well. As the morning went by, they kept an eye on the tornado, but realised in the early afternoon that it was moving slowly towards them. 
Horses were running from it as well, which appeared to be extremely unsettling for Jackson. However, while they were continuously looking at the tornado, they failed to notice that Teresa, from five, was running through this field of wheat and straight up behind them. When she was quite close, Jackson, Rio and Blade all noticed that she was being chased by Boris, who was quickly catching up with her. The tornado was also moving quickly towards them, and the wheat surrounding them was being ripped out of the ground. As Teresa got closer, she was tackled by Boris, and as he stabbed her to death with his scythe, Rio shouted that they needed to run away. Blade then stopped a horse that was close to them, and got on, before heading off and trying to convince Rio and Jackson to do the same. Rio then pointed at Boris, who was now running towards them, and then practically forced Jackson onto a nearby horse with her, before they rode the horse away in the same direction as Blade. Rio was able to force the horse to charge away very quickly from both Boris and the tornado, which Jackson found quite unsettling at first. However, the group spent the majority of the next two days riding the horses in order to keep away from the tornado, so he soon became used to the horses, and later admitted that he even grew quite attached to the one that they were riding. By the morning of the ninth day, the tornado appeared to have stopped, and with seven tributes now remaining, Jackson, Rio and Blade continued towards the cornucopia for when the feast would be announced. Just as they were making their way towards the inner fields, the game makers announced that the feast would now be held. This surprised the three of them, as there would usually be a delay between the feast's announcement and its inception. However, they continued running back, and as they approached the cornucopia clearing, it appeared to be empty. The three of them therefore jumped up and ran through the wheat until they reached the cornucopia clearing. They grabbed their feast bags and were confused that nobody else seemed to be around, but remembered that they were probably closest to the cornucopia when the feast was announced. However, as they were starting to walk away from the cornucopia clearing, Laverne and Boris suddenly jumped out from the nearby wheat and then headed straight towards the trio. Laverne even had a bow and arrow and was now firing arrows straight in their direction. Jackson tried not to freeze this time, but Blade was very quickly hit in the stomach by one of Laverne's arrows before he collapsed, and Boris then ran up to him and stabbed him through the head with his scythe, which sounded his cannon. As Rio and Jackson tried to flee, Rio was then hit in the arm by an arrow, and Laverne sprinted towards her, whilst Boris knocked Jackson to the ground and tried to push his scythe through his neck, which Jackson was trying hard to keep from piercing his skin. Jackson eventually managed to get a hand free and then punched Boris in the face so violently that it knocked him out. Jackson did not even consider punching him with his other hand, but then ran to help Rio who was being strangled by Laverne and was desperately trying to escape from her grip. However, just as Laverne saw Jackson approaching, she quickly snapped Rio's neck and her cannon boomed out. Jackson struggled to make sense of what had just happened, but he then grabbed the scythe from Boris's hand and quickly pursued Laverne as she ran away laughing. However, being much bigger than Laverne, Jackson quickly caught up with her, and even though she shot an arrow which hit him in the chest, he hardly noticed before he tackled her to the ground. Although Jackson was now devastated and in a state of shock that Laverne had just murdered Rio, he grabbed Boris's scythe and calmly slashed Laverne's neck, which left her bleeding out on the floor. Jackson was tempted to use his other hand as well to stab her neck, but at this point he no longer cared, and left her to bleed out as her body started convulsing on the floor. He then ran from the cornucopia before any other tributes appeared, before breaking down in tears in a grove of trees, apparently distraught that his friend, Rio, had just been murdered in front of him. The next day, he rested in this grove and hardly moved, except to grab some food from his bag. As he saw horses approach, he became particularly upset, and later stated that he thought they were waiting to see Rio after they had seen him. However, on the eleventh day, Jackson heard a cannon, which was later revealed to be silver from Seven and then he guessed that he and the remaining other two tributes would soon need to return to the cornucopia. As Jackson awoke on the twelfth day, he heard intense winds, and then realised that a tornado was quickly moving towards him. He grabbed the scythe and ran back to the cornucopia, whilst the wheat from the surrounding field was continuously being ripped up by the wind. As he ran back into the cornucopia clearing, he appeared to be the only tribute there at the time. However, a minute later, he noticed Boris running towards him from the other direction. However, just as Boris was about to enter the cornucopia clearing, Clara, from twelve, suddenly sprang up to the side of Boris and shot him in the temple with an arrow, which knocked him over and immediately sounded his cannon. Clara shot more arrows at Jackson as she ran towards him, whilst he carefully dodged her arrows and was only hit once in the shoulder, which he failed to notice at the time. By the time Jackson had caught up with Clara, she had run out of arrows and tried to run away, but Jackson tackled her before slamming her head into the ground, which knocked her unconscious. While she was knocked out, Jackson then stabbed her with his scythe, which won him this year's games. After leaving the arena, 
Jackson seemed somewhat shaken, but overall more confident, and during his Victor's interview, Caesar still struggled to get some conversation out of Jackson, but less so than before. When he returned to District 10, he opted to live a quiet life in the Victor's village, before opening some new stables, which allowed for more horses in the district. He opted to call these stables the Rio Stables, after his ally, Rio. These stables went on to be extremely popular, and they helped children familiarise themselves with the horses. However, he went on to die in the 75th Hunger Games. Hello, hello, hello. So, thank you once again for watching the video. And I'm now going to answer some of the questions that were featured in last week's video. So, question one, first of all, is Senor Lazy Bambarino. He asked, can you maybe explain about the reclamation of 88? I still don't know what it is quite yet, and I can't find much on the wiki page. Sorry, it's my mother. So, first of all, we know that Hamish died in the reclamation of 88. Secondly, Michelle, who won the 54th Games, she was from District 10, she was faced with the victor's choice. Now, she considered both options, but one of the options was to move to the capital, which is where she went. They'll be given more options, they'll be more explained about that in future videos. Um, next part, Cecilia's daughter, Crochette, was killed in the 76th Hunger Games, which also took place in 88. This is directly linked to the victor's choice as well. And finally, we know that in the 76th Games in 88, there were 30 tributes. Now, it will be explained shortly why there were an extra six, but if you look closely at the numbers of people making different choices in future videos, you might figure out why there were six extra. I'm not going to say anything more about that there, though. Also, just to avoid any confusion, there was Capital Games, which took place in 78. 78, by the way, is the number after the year, for example, the 60th Games, which were won by Cecilia, took place in 60. The 50th Games, which were won by Hamish, took place in 50. The first book takes place in 74, the second in 75, and the third one, Mockingjay, took it, takes place in 76. Two years later in this universe, the Capital Games occurred that lots of people have been asking about, so that will be a video by itself. I made the arena the other day. I hope you'll be pleased. And so that's all I'm going to say about the reclamation for now, but it will all be explained. It's not going to be like Lost, where you sort of get to the end and think, okay, where were the answers? Because, God, oh, that annoyed me. Anyway, question two. Charlie Kayser asked, uh, it's obvious that this series is faring extremely well. Ooh, thank you. But I've got to ask for the millionth time, sorry if I haven't got back to you, are you going to pass the hundredth games? I know that you said, Jay, it depends on the series, and the series is doing well. Thank you. Have you started vaguely planning for past the 100th? Also, you should contact Suzanne Collins or Lionsgate to make a series on Netflix or something amazing vid. Been looking forward to it. Can't wait till Monday. How very nice of you. Thank you very much. So that sounds sarcastic because I just say that, as I just said that. Uh, it's not meant to. No, seriously, all the support really makes it worth it. Um, and oh God, I would love to make these into videos. I do have ideas about how all of them look, but that's another video. Right, short answer is, I would love to go past the 100th. I have plenty of ideas still remaining. I've got lots of ideas of different storylines, arenas, kills. Uh, sometimes I'm just walking my dog and think, ooh, that would look nice as an arena. And um, yes, I have plenty more. I'd love to carry it on. Even as a full-time job, that would be epic. But um, it's just about whether I can sort of get enough time to do it. Um, the amount of subscribers I'm getting is certainly going up as well so I mean if it's possible I would love to carry on although after the 75th I warned that it might just be one video a week because of work etc but it really depends however I'm certainly going up to 100 at least I would love to go beyond um question three stealth asks so how many minutes or hours does it take for you to think about a game to think about to think about a game not actually that long however making it is what takes ages. It takes me roughly, on average, about four hours to write out each game, and then a further two hours for each game to do editing, recording, all that sort of thing. But all the comments of support, everything like that, really make it worth it. Uh, next question is Ananya Gos. Sorry, I might be mispronouncing that. Apologies if I am. How do you edit your vids? Which apps do you use? PowerPoint. Judge me as you will, but I used to be a teacher, 
still am technically, and um, secondary school, and yeah, PowerPoint, I used a lot then. I know there are all these new things you can use to make video, but I find it really complicated to be honest. So I do that, and then I use Windows Movie Maker to make my videos. So far, my, so far for me it hasn't really gone wrong, so I'm probably going to carry on with that because it's what I'm most used to. Uh, and then f question five, Fernando Mode, Fernando Mojedano, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, uh, asks, which of these Hunger Games was your favourite to create? <sighs> this was tough. Um, there are several that really stand out to me. Um, although I think Cecilia's games, with the mix of penguins sort of flapping around whilst there was a sonic surge, that for me would, I would love to direct that with the penguins going <laughs> whilst all this explosions and stuff are going on. Um, that was one I really enjoyed creating. Also the abandoned hospital for Lyme. That was one I kept thinking about. I kept thinking, oh god, that would be creepy as hell. There were lots though that I really enjoy making. Also, oh, Gregor's game with Magneta. That was one I like. Bluebell, yeah. <laughs> that's one I enjoyed as well. Yeah, uh, that's a tough one though. <laughs> uh, next, Jude Finney asks... Ooh, oh yeah. Sorry, actually, I've just made a slight error on here. Uh, pasted in the wrong one. It does happen. I'm trying to get all this in one take, so please bear with me. One second. I hope everyone's having a nice day, by the way, just whilst I'm sorting this out. And, yeah, how is everyone's weather where they are? Here it's been a bit rubbish, to be honest. Oh, well. Went to the zoo the other day, it was rather nice though. It gave me some more ideas for mutts as well. Yeah, I felt rather sadistic walking around the park and looking at all the animals, but yeah, still. Uh, right, where are we? Jude Finney. Mm -hmm. Ah, there we go. Right. What tribute would you like to hear more of? Uh, so, that's a good question. Sorry about delay there. Uh, there's lots I would love to hear more of, and I do have lots of ideas for spin-offs. Um, mentioned in this video, Alejandro Farnham. I have several ideas of potential spin-offs, but that's one I would love to go with, because I think out in this universe he's had quite an interesting storyline. He was the one who was gay for play, yes, that's what I'm saying, for his games. And then, yes, he was not really gay, by the way, for those who are wondering. He was straight. And then potentially... Um, he popped up again as a mentor. That's one that I would like to hear a bit more of. Also, there are certain, there's a certain fan favourite who's inspired by a certain person who is actually going to be maybe in charge of an arena, not so much in charge of a future arena, but this person has a place that's going to be involved in an arena, which I really look forward to making. Um, Septimus Baddock as well, Psycho Septimus, he'd be a great one to hear more from. Um, he's the one who pretty much killed about 20 people in his arena. I would love to make more based on him. Next question, seven. Life Schwa asks, first of all, I freaking love these videos. Thank you. I freaking love these comments. About all the games, second, what is your favourite character name? Uh, I think I'd have to go with Earth Goldstein. Earth, um, some people were saying that's got nothing to do with electricity. It certainly does. The Earth Wire in the socket, something like that, it's to do with that, the earth fuse, I can't remember, once I got an electric shock and someone said it was to do with the earth wire, so yeah, that's probably one of my favourite ones, I've got several different names that I rather like, and also speaking of names, I have different themes for each district, um, so district one is usually gems and rock stones, two, Roman names, um, three, anything to do with electricity, or sometimes I just look around, think of an app, and sort of make that into a name, four, anything to do with fish or water, Five, anything to do with power, that's my district by the way, anything to do with power but also um, measurements of things. Six, yep, US states and places. Seven, anything to do with woods and trees. Eight, I usually try to relate it to textiles and knitting, things like that. Nine, I try to relate it to harvesting grain, that sort of thing. Ten, as it's in Texas, um, my brother in law's from Texas, by the way, and there's lots of Hispanic sounding places and names, I try to base it on that. Also, I think 10 might be in modern day Mexico, correct me if I'm wrong, but that sort of means that I give a bit of emphasis to that. 11, anything to do with plants and um, trees, things like that. And 12, 
I pretty much just use normal names because most of them seem to actually have fairly normal names. And also I throw in normal names as well, just inwards. And uh, it might change as things move on, you'll see. And also, question eight is from GamerX38953. What would be your strategy if you were in the Hunger Games? Offensive or defensive? <laughs> so, uh, there's a reason I'm aligned to District 5. I would try to keep a low profile during training, but during the interviews I would just try to be really entertaining. Maybe a bit fake in order to get some sponsors, but I would just do anything to make the crowds happy. And try and be remembered in any way. I would not lie, I would be an attention seeker during the interviews. Won't lie about it. Um, also, I would try to make an alliance with other tributes during training. I try not to step on anyone's, tro anyone's toes, try to keep a low profile. I'd make an alliance with, tr well, try to make an alliance with other tributes, preferably female tributes, because I come from a very female dominated background, so I'd find them a bit easier to, I find women a bit easier to read sometimes. And also at the start, what Wireless did, that's based on what I would do. I would literally stand on my podium. And then if all hell were breaking loose in the cornucopia, I'd think, oh, get out of here, and I'd run off. But if it weren't too bad and I could see some things that weren't being used or taken yet, I'd actually run and grab them. So I hope for the best there. And then I would ally with some people for a while, but I would probably be that um, douchebag who ends up stabbing someone randomly who they thought were an ally. I'd probably say sorry as I did it, but towards the end I would get pretty ruthless. That's how I hope I would win. And next final question, question nine. Sophia G asks, are you going to include and WLW, sorry, I don't know what that means, someone might want to explain that, lesbian, bi or pan girls uh, couples in the future? There isn't much representation, representation in the media and this is my favourite series so it would mean a lot. Thank you very much for saying it's your favourite series, that really is genuinely nice thing to say and that makes me very happy. And first answer, yes. There are going to be some in the future, there is already one planned. Um, I won't say yet when it is, but there is one planned. And yeah, I think it sucks a bit that there isn't so much representation in the media of women who are not straight, but there are definitely going to be some included, yes. And I look forward to including them as well. Sorry, I just had to sort out something with our dog. So something I'll say apart from the answer that I've given is also there is a channel which I have been in collaboration with which has started to make Sims 4 versions of the games. It's been rather interesting so far and there's already been one made and I'll put a link to this channel in the description. Also, something I'm going to ask is would anyone be willing to make any starting art that I could be used? You might notice that I've put in a few more bits in this um, in these videos, if someone were able to include sort of non-district specific or non-tribute specific so that it could be used in any video, but for a reaping, so maybe showing a crowd, for example, for the back with this platform, if they, uh, one for the parade, one for training, one for when they're having their training scores assessed, and one for the interviews as well, if they were able to make it so that it didn't show any tributes directly or wasn't specific to a district, that would be epic and of course I would feature a link to your website or social media where you make this in the description and I would give you a shout out of course and it would be really good if I could include something like that so if you are a cunning artist let me know and I think that's about it anyway I will see you next week where we're doing game 67 to 69 adios tributes